I wanted to talk in, in, in terms of both the assessment part of mold testing, as well as, you know, the sample collection too. They, they really are two components that really should be intertwined when you're looking at your data. It's not just you look at your mold report and you have all the answers right then and there. Uh, honestly, it's really looking at the assessment side of things as well as looking at from the test results. So anytime that I'm looking at my data, I'm looking at the property inspection right next to it, I've printed out the mold report. So I, I view them as intertwined and you should certainly view it that way too. I, I highly recommend it. It makes it a lot easier when you're just looking at a bunch of numbers. It's really intimidating. But once you have that assessment right next to it, it gets a little less intimidating, I feel. I did want to give a warning that I am not going to go right into data. I, I would love to go right into data, but we got to kind of start off with just a baseline understanding about mold and kind of similar with the inspections, you know, having that with your mold report, kind of just knowing some basic facts about mold and why it exists and how it exists in our indoor environments and in the outdoor environment, you know, that kind of information. It's it's all going to kind of help at the end of the day. So I, I know I'm going to ramble a little bit about mold and why it's cool and, why, you know, all these fun facts, but I promise at the end of the day, it will help you when you're looking at your data. It's, it's just going to make it a lot easier. You will see, I promise. So hold on. <laughs> and if anything like seems like you want to touch on it a little bit more, just let me know and stop me too. Um, so basically, people will use different words, mold, mildew, yeast, fungi, th those are all meaning the same thing, kind of think of them as equals. So if you have a customer coming up to you and they say, ah, I'm really worried about mildew in my house, you know, they're all talking about the same mold test or fungi test. Um, if you talk to a lab, they'll almost always say fungi, and that's just the more proper term to call it because it encompasses all these different types of, you know, mold, mildew, and yeast. So if you hear somebody from a science perspective, they'll probably say fungi, but you guys are talking about the same thing. Um, same as when a homeowner comes to you and asks about yeast or uh, mildew in their home, you know, they're all talking about the same stuff. Um, and one thing too, is that mold is everywhere. You know, we're never going to escape it. And that's probably one of the best things to think about and why it gets so complicated when you're looking at your data is because we can't run away from mold. It's always going to be in our air. It's going to be in our settled dust. It's going to be attached to our clothes or our hair. It's always just going to be around us. I, I kind of like to think of the song in Frozen of love is an open door, but instead it's mold is an open door. It's always going to be around us. Um, and you kind of need to remember that when you're looking at your data too, because it, you're going to see mold spores in your indoor samples. It's never going to, well, sometimes it is, but it's usually not a none detected. There's no mold in the air. You did it. You win. That's a safe home. It doesn't necessarily mean that just because, you know, people are going to open their doors to get inside. You know, people are going to move around. It's just always going to be there. So just kind of remember, they're always going to be present. That's just natural and there's just no way to live in a glass box and never get out of it, and then you're not exposed to mold. It's always going to be there in some capacity. So if somebody goes through and they find mold or an inspector says, you got mold, you know, the key thing is for both you and the customer is to just not panic. It doesn't mean you need to burn the house down. A lot of people think that they need to pull out of a sale because there was mold found at the house, even if it's a tiny little spot. It's really not the end of the world if you find a piece of mold growing on a little spot on the wall or something like that. Obviously, if it was a flooded home and it's, you know, it went all the way up the wall, you know, that's, that's probably a little bit more. Uh, it's going to be a lot more expensive to remediate that, but it doesn't mean you need to fume the home and, you know, kill everything on site, you know, it's, it's really a manageable thing. And one thing when thinking about remediating it is you're not 
trying to remediate mold per se. You're actually trying to remediate the source of why mold grew in the first place. You can think of molds as just a symptom. Uh, so wa water is one of the key elements which we'll go into of why it grows. And so when you remediate for mold, it's actually remediating the water component to it. And mold is just the symptom of the water problem. You know, it's just kind of an indicator that you have a water issue. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit on this too, but there is a lot of health variations from person to person on exposure to molds. Like I know of some inspectors who walk into a home, they can sniff it once and they can tell there's mold in the house. And then, you know, there's some other people who just can't smell anything at all. I've had so many husband and wives call me and say, my husband can't smell anything, but I smell that musty odor. There's, there's just, uh, that's just how it is with pollen. It's the same thing of one person can have, you know, a stuffy nose, irritation, but the right person next to them has nothing at all. Doesn't mean one person's crazy for saying they're feeling sick in a property, especially in a apartment complex. You have a lot of that. One unit is having health symptoms, but the next isn't. Same in an office building. But just kind of remember that not every human being has health effects in the same way. You know, it's, it's an allergen. Um, it can trigger people's asthma um, kind of a situation, but it really depends on the person. And that's one of the reasons why there isn't kind of a yes or no, you're going to have health symptoms with mold. It's just because it varies greatly from one person to the next. Do you guys have any questions about health and mold while we're on this topic? No? Okay. So probably one of the most important parts of dealing with mold in a home is actually how does it grow? Knowing, you know, why does it grow in the first place in the indoor environment? Because usually when you think of mold, you think of it out in the forest, you know, and when you think about where you see a lot of mushrooms, um, you can think of, you know, where, what kind of forest do you think of? You think of a lush, wet forest, while if you think of a desert, you probably don't think of mushrooms at all. Uh, you can kind of think of that from when you're looking at different homes, you know, are you walking into a really wet and humid basement or are you walking into a really dry clean home those are kind of different lenses you can think about how mold grows in a home too so it doesn't matter what type you're dealing with with fungi or mold it all needs the same three things in order to grow it needs water it needs food and it needs the right temperature and with temperature we can't really fix that in a home. You know, us humans, we like to live in a very comfortable, not too hot, not too cold, kind of 70 degrees temperature range. And that's just the same temperature range of mold. You know, we're not gonna freeze out our house all the time or overheat our house because we wanna kill all the mold. You know, that isn't something we can really fix. It's just something we have to learn to live with. Um, same with the food. Our homes are just little processed forests. It's filled with paper products everywhere. It's filled with our hair dander, or dust, or skin cells. You know, that's all in our dust bunnies. Even if we were to live in like a metal box, you know, you see on windowsills, those plastic windowsills, you'll get dust and debris there. And sometimes you'll get mold growth there because there's dirt on there. It's not because it's growing on the plastic. It's all of that settled dust there. So there's always going to be food for it too. We can't fix that. But like I was saying before, we can really fix the water. That's kind of the key thing that we can do. And that's kind of why in the industry we'll say, follow the water. That's how you're going to find where the mold can be or will be, you know, and you'll kind of use your eyes and your nose to look for the water, but also smell that musty odor. And They'll, they'll usually ask themselves, you know, where, where was the water found? Is there any liquid water there flooding, water stains or anything like that? Was there high humidity in one area, you know, particularly the basement or the attic? A lot of people will look for humidity readings down there. Uh, same with exhaust vents. One amazing thing that I found since working in this industry is that so many even new builds, the bathroom vent goes right into the attic. It doesn't actually go out the roof. It just goes there, gets trapped by the roof. There's no venting out of the attic space. Like it's, and then all of a sudden they're like, holy cow, like I've lived in this new house for a year and all of a sudden I have all of this mold in my attic and I don't know why. 
So kind of knowing where, where is your air breathing, especially humid air breathing from one room to the next. And in, in my personal home, I have a really humid basement and it rises all the way up to my first floor of my house. Like I don't have any moisture issues in my basement. It just rises on up. But once I remediated the basement level by putting in ventilation and also a, a dehumidifier before I got that, all of that reduced the water component down there. And so all of a sudden my first floor wasn't having all of that condensation on the windows anymore because I fixed the bottom, the basement level. I fixed all of that humid, humid air in the winter time for me, which was fun. <laughs> So again, we're just gonna kind of talk about mold inspections that kind of is the first component. It's kind of a pro, like a, it's a point of the home inspections where they're looking around for signs of water and mold. And it's not like you hire somebody, like say your client requests a mold test. Hopefully that, that home inspector comes in and they do a visual walk through the property and they look for signs of water and mold and then they collect the samples. You know, hopefully they don't just walk right in, they slap the pump down and say, well, hope for the best. Most of them will kind of put, hopefully, <laughs> but most of them will put the pump in an area of probably high concern. You know, they use moisture meters, which is right here on the left here. Um, they'll use infrared is also, some people will use those because this is actually, um, it's a really cool picture. I really like it. Uh, it shows, you know, it looks like a normal carpet, but it actually, there was a flood down there and all underneath that carpet is flooded. And so this is why sometimes you'll have people smell that musty odor, but not see anything. Uh, and so if, say he didn't do an infrared test and he did a mold test, well, there could be an elevated level for sure because that water component's there. So uh, a lot of times I've had people, you know, do this in office spaces and all of a sudden there's like a huge spike of spores even though they didn't see any mold on the walls or anything like that and it was just underneath the carpet so that's like one so really the using these other tools besides just you know your mold kit this is all really helpful to kind of know you know what is your what will your data kind of look like and i kind of like to think you know, the where, the when, and the why, when they're collecting their samples. Do, where do they collect it? Do they collect it in the basement? Do they see anything in that area? Or say it was a property that's been vacant for a really long time, and there was a lot of just dust everywhere. Um, you know, when they walked through, all of a sudden they're kicking up all of that dust that was sit around when that inspector comes through. And inspectors, you know, they're getting into everything. They're going to kick up a lot of stuff into the air. And so that's kind of skewing your results to all that settled debris all into your sample. Um, and then also, you know, why did they put the pump where it is? I'll be very blunt with my, whenever I talk to an inspector and say, why did you put the pump there? You know, why did you put it in this room and not in the other? More often than not, they'll say, oh, well, it was because I did a moisture meter reading or I did a thermal temp reading. And it just looked like there was just a lot of water in that area, but I couldn't find any mold. Usually they'll use mold tests to kind of confirm or deny what they're seeing visually with that test. And so most of the time they'll always, the pump. what's that? Can you explain the pump? What it's, yeah, what it's so, doing? so right here, this is a pump. Uh, usually people don't put them along corners or sides like this, especially near such a door. I wouldn't recommend doing that, but usually they'll put them right in the center. And so uh, you can see it better over here. So that's the little spore trap sample that he collects. And so what they'll do is they'll collect it for a certain period of time. And that the, you want to obviously collect for however long, the longest you can. Because the longer you do, the more representative you are to the room, you know, uh, but you can't. That like five minutes, 20 minutes? I mean, it's usually either a five or a 10 minute test. Okay. That's most commonly what they run it for. And that's just because these, these brands of cassettes, they have a certain amount of particulates they can hold. You know, there is a maximum capacity because when we analyze these in the lab, we actually put them under a microscope. And I'll show you kind of what that looks like too and what that means. But um, so when you collect, you don't want to collect too much because you can't see anything. And so usually people will change 
say they went into that vacant home that was really dusty and dirty, they're probably not going to collect for the max time, like 10 minutes. They'll probably only collect for like two, three minutes max at that time, because there's just going to be a lot of stuff in the air. And so then you can't really see too much when we look at it under the microscope. Aaron, so is this just like a mechanical air test, essentially, or? Yeah, so basically, this is just an air pump. All it does okay. is it sucks in a volumetric air. So okay. it has a certain flow rate, so how fast it's sucking in the air. And then you run the pump for a certain amount of minutes. So that gets you a liter box, you know, of air. And that's why on your report, you're going to see two different columns of data. You're going to see a count, which is what the lab counts. So I go through the lab, uh, through the sample, and I count how many spores I see. And then right next to it, you'll see what's called that counts per cubic meter. Basically, we take however long you ran the pump and however fast, we take our counts and we put it into a volumetric box. So how many spores would be in a cubic meter box? And so you can kind of think of it a little more visually when you see your numbers that way. And most home inspectors interpret based on those counts per cubic meter. So it's just a cubic meter box of air and that's how much mold is inside of it. So is this how everyone is doing mold testing? Now, I can't even remember the last time someone actually bothered to do a test. Oh, I, I thought it was, I thought it was just like, kind of like a uh, an air radon test where there was just some sort of canister or something that was left in a in an attic for instance and then picked up a few days later or something so there is some pretty sketchy home depot kits that so many people buy uh and uh it's there are where you leave a little culture plate open wherever you want and you leave it there for however long you want and then whatever happens to land on the plate cool you did it you did a mold oh, okay. test <laughs> um but way, it's not way. a swab test like this this up uh, this yeah this so people do swab tests both, right? both. that's pretty common but that's like mm -hmm. a strict you know you see a discolored surface and you want to know whether that's mold or not or you, somebody has a known sensitivity to penicillium mm -hmm. or penicillin, they can't take that drug. You know, they want to make sure that it's not penicillium growing in the house. And so they'll take a swab test or what's called a tape lift, which is basically taking that discoloration, putting it on a sample, and then we analyze it in the lab. Because I thought for mold to be mold, it had to be airborne. Like something on a surface wasn't technically mold. The spores had to be active in the air. Is so that not quite true. Well, mold grows on a surface, but okay. what, think of, uh, you know, those um, big mushroom balls in your yard that you'll step on and it makes a little poof. Yeah. So basically you're doing the same thing on a wall. So you have this, somebody walks by and all of a sudden you have a little poof of spores yeah. into the air, or it'll just naturally release spores into the air. It's, you know, we're dealing with, uh, it's not a plant, but it's kind of like a plant releasing its pollen spores. Mm -hmm. It's trying to spread as much as it can. And so that's why people will do an air test to just kind of see how many spores are in the air, but more easily interpreted is the surface test because oh. that mm -hmm. is what is actually, that's the mold itself. Of so um, another thing that they do, so yeah, they'll do surface tests, they'll do the air test, this is actually this tubing here. This is a wall cavity test. So basically they're running this tubing in behind the wall because sometimes I've actually had a apartment, or not an apartment, a, a office building and they had a flood and they didn't notice, like they cleaned it instantly. They did like all of the right things. They cleaned out, uh, they dried the area out really quick. But all of a sudden, like a week later, people were having, you know, all of a sudden they were just feeling weird, just a couple of people in the office. So they came in and they did um, an air test and it was elevated, um, but they couldn't find where it was visually. They couldn't find where that growth was. You know, they looked under the carpets, they couldn't find it. And so they did this wall cavity test. And on the other side of the sheetrock, 
there was a whole slew of molds, all nice and happy on the other side of the drywall. And so instead of, you know, tearing down drywall and seeing if there's something behind it, there is a little tubing that you can put in. Sometimes you'll need to drill a small hole if you can't get behind the electrical unit. But this is kind of like test, if you can't find it anywhere, but you smell it, you know there's water and you just can't find where it comes from, this wall cavity test is what some people will do too. It only runs for one minute. <laughs> because there's so much stuff <laughs> um but it catches a lot it, it does it's a lot better than cutting a wall kind of thing so those are typically what people will do i find that some inspectors offer a mold inspection packet which includes the walkthrough uh, maybe at least two air samples and then maybe some surface samples if they see fit or i have people who ask the customer how many samples they want you to collect um, or what's their budget for it because ultimately that means how many samples can they take because it is it is pretty expensive to do especially um, having the inspector come through collect all these samples and then they have to interpret it too once it comes back to us so it is pretty expensive they try to do as minimal as possible but it's kind of up to the customer how much they really want to spend on it. Any other questions on sampling? Are you going to cover that later, or what? What? What does it roughly cost to do mold testing? I really can't even say because it's okay. up to the inspector to set it. Okay. They, they a lot of people, and like I said, they do different packages, so okay. I can't even say what the average cost is. And most of them don't even post it on the website, so I can't even see. Okay. Yeah. I, I usually tell people when I have just homeowners call me, I tell them to shop around. I give them, you know, the names of some companies that I know of, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the right fit for them financially or experience wise. There's certainly some inspectors who work in exclusively older homes and they're like really good at older homes. And there's someone who right next to them is so much better at new builds, new construction and inspecting those types of properties. And even more so you find people who haven't been doing mold testing for that long, which you know sometimes is a good thing because they are freshly trained. They know exactly what they need to look for. Um, or there's someone who's been doing it for you know 30 years and should have a lot of experience under their belt. So it really varies a lot in terms of pricing and their experience varies a lot. So definitely, I always say shop around. It never hurts to call and explain your situation and then move on to the next, like it's, it's their job. Anything else? Okay. Tasha, said, have... oh, Tasha, I almost said your name wrong. Did you just <laughs> say um, that you recently dealt with this? But yeah, so I have a listing and the buyers did a mold test because we they found some a couple spots up in the attic and they found um, some spots in some human um, environment in the crawl space. It's dirt crawl space with poly over it. So do you remember how test. do you remember how much that ran? I'm just curious too, because that were the sellers. Thing. I don't know. I yeah, the buyers for... did it, so I don't know. Sure. I know that'll be the first thing call. people will ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I got the report back, and that's what popped in my call to Aaron to figure it. Just the hard to read, and obviously yeah. it's straight on and etc. So. So really, and honestly, I have people who call me and they ask to borrow our pump because I keep a pump just in case someone needs one and um, they want to collect it themselves. And <laughs> I tell them really don't okay? because I'm not going to be able to interpret this, you know, legally for you. And mm -hmm. any, I haven't been at the house. I don't know your health symptoms like I, and I, that would be way more than the cost of the test. You know, that's a whole consulting, you know, you could pay me if you want to be a consultant, but a home inspector should be the consultant, the collector kind of all in one, you know, that's kind of all included in that fee if not just coming on site collecting the samples, they're going to help interpret the project as well to the best of their ability and if they're not sure they call me or the whatever lab they're using, just to kind of give them more information. Should so I'm at the point where after I talked to you, we, we remediated the source as far as we know, obviously being a, you know, she's a homeowner, had mm -hmm. something come out and hopefully remediated the source. Um, we would like to retest uh, potentially um, to, who would, I mean, would I call the inspector? Would I call you? So some people will hire the same retest. inspector. So Another they have, 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, other than that, people, there's some remediation companies that collect them themselves, okay. but um, most people will just hire someone else to just come in, yeah. let them know that it's been remediated, and they'll just come in, take the test, and leave. Okay. That's what I like. It's like more of an independent person. Yeah. That wouldn't do the remediation after if that's the case. Yeah. And they call that a post remediation verification. Mm -hmm. PRV right. is what usually they'll call it. And it, there I should, yes, on the next slide, um, okay. <laughs> actually, um, the, this is, uh, and I'm going to give you the links of some like really great. I, I know it's not fun taking the time to read through things, but honestly, the more you read, the more helpful you're going to be to your customers and the more knowledgeable you're going to be towards them. And I say that adds a lot of value to you as an agent, as a home inspector, you know, it, it it's well worth the time, especially in something that's unstandardized. Um, this is actually almost quote for quote um, off of the CDC's EPA and OSHA's website. Um, when they have a whole section about mold on there. And what they say, uh, like you were saying, is there, there is no standard of what is healthy, what is not. And, you know, they say it's, it's health-based. That's the reason why they really can't is because one person's not going to have symptoms while another person is going to get utterly sick. There's, there's just no ifs, ands, or about it. So there isn't really a healthy amount of mold in the house going to change, especially like all of a sudden you have a rainy week, you're going to have a lot of different types of mold in the air, a lot of amounts of mold in the air during that. Same as when it's dry spell, there's different types of mold that like those different types of environments. So it's hard to say, you know, all of a sudden one month you're having symptoms, kind of like spring, like all of a sudden all of the goldenrod is exploding all of the pollen and all those people sensitive to goldenrod is dying, you know, to all these health effects and, you know, not feeling great. And then the next month they're fine. It's kind of the so, same. So is there more about the black mold? Like everyone says, oh my God, this black mold. Like it's the most. Don't worry. I'm going to talk about it. It's my trigger. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> it's Perfect. my trigger. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I can't even get, even when I'm talking to inspectors, I always tell them, don't you dare say those words to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'll talk about that for sure. Uh, so this is, so uh, I'll usually say this is, I am not sugarcoating it at all. They, they do not recommend routine air sampling. They, they do not, no, nobody, if you go to all these websites, they'll all say don't test for mold. And I, I have so many people who just say they want that peace of mind. They want to know, and that's worth the money to them. Um, or, and there are instances where people are immunocompromised. There's, there's a lot more of them than I thought. Um, ask them if they know and they can, can't take penicillin, the medicine, you know, they're going to be much more sensitive or if they have a known sensitivity then yeah, testing makes sense. Or like in the case of that office building, they, the inspector went through, he couldn't find it anywhere. And what he needed to do was collect that mold test. And all of a sudden he found it. And that's just the way it is. Like they don't recommend doing it, especially they say routine, you know, you're not going to go through and every time you do an inspection, collect a mold sample. That's not really recommended to do that for every property because every property is different. And a lot of times you can, an inspector walks into a home, they see a giant mold spot and they're like, yeah, I don't need to test. It's mold. You need to fix the water problem. And they're spending their time looking for the source. You know, they're not looking at that mold for that long. They're looking why it grew. That's kind of the key component to it. And like we were talking about before, sampling can be used as a guide to determine the extent of an infestation um, and how effective the cleanup is. They say, yeah, that's helpful. This is from OSHA. Um, and I think this is a really great quote. Um, it, you know, it can be used as a guide to find, like, if somebody cleaned themselves or something and they didn't use containment. They didn't close off one area to another and there was like a whole wall of mold and they didn't like close the door or use plastic to seal that room off from the rest of the house. And all of a sudden they're having mold growing in the room right next door. Well, it's probably because when they were mediating, they kicked up all that dust in the air. They had the door wide open and they solved the water in that room, but not in that room. And so all of a sudden they have another issue. So mold testing can be helpful to just really 
make sure everything's done, like that post remediation verification, that PRV testing. Um, I have a lot of people who do that. I, I find that more common that people will do that just to make sure that they got everything out because they'll use those those HEPA filters to air exchange clean. They call it like air scrubbing the air. Um, so people will use that PRV testing in those cases. So if like with my, it's in my cellar um, where she believes she's remediated the source um, and she's got the she's put a dehumidifier down there. She's got the humidity down to like 35%. It's nice mm -hmm. and dry, clean, seems to be dry and clean, mm -hmm. quote unquote. Um, would you recommend retest the mold and for the air test and how long do you wait? that exchange naturally happen in your house? So mold, so say a mold spore comes into a, a nice and wet mm -hmm. basement. It takes one to two days for it to start to grow. And it takes about seven days for it to get fully mature and happy. So okay. I usually give it, you know, a week because then your air is kind oh, of settled. So not long. To, yeah, Pretty I mean, quick. I have people who wait a month, you know, okay. yeah, or when cool. they think about it. <laughs> I think we're at a month anyways now, <laughs> just about. Yeah, right. It, it really, there, there isn't a, a strict guideline. Right. right. Okay. Everybody kind of does their best. There is like some amazing. But it's pretty quick. Yeah. In general, quick to grow and quick to remediate. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of why almost all of these guidance documents, almost mm -hmm. all of their webpage talks about prevention preventing right. mold to grow because mm -hmm. it, it's always around us, like I said. So mm -hmm. it's an open opportunity at any point to start growing. And yeah, the one to two days, all of a sudden it starts growing if you have that water problem. Um, and that's, that's kind of why I keep, I, I try to keep a humidity reader down in my wettest part of my house. So in my basement, mm -hmm. and I, I know we're in Maine, it's the season changes so much from month to month to day to day to week to week. Um, and so just like kind of looking at how your humidity is doing can tell you a lot other, as to whether that humidity is gonna condense on cold pipes, condense on, cold, on your cold windows from the, you know, the hot outside, cold inside. You know, that your humidity can tell you a lot um, and it varies a lot in Maine. So kind of preventing mold is probably the most key component and why they talk about it so much. But, but I was gonna say there's the percentages. Like, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, the your 34 is perfect. Uh, they say less than 34% humidity. Okay. Yeah. Um, some people say less than 50, but 40. 40 is safe. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, they do, inspectors do have some like really nice guidance um, and they'll refer to this book in almost all of the websites. This is kind of the holy grail. Um, doesn't really matter for you guys, but like they do have, guidance and it's recommended everywhere um, for them to follow but the key is it's not standardized no one's required to follow this they just say you should kind of a thing and that's why everyone does it differently you know some people buy the 200 dollar book and some people don't it's not required there's some states like texas and florida are required <laughs> to have laws but uh, level. <laughs> yeah I, uh, I've uh I've met some people from those states and they even say the laws don't even help down there they still have the same issues which is surprising so I don't know maybe it'll never change I guess this world we live in so um let's just hop into surface so this is just a very sorry it's a little blurry but um this is a surface test so what we're looking at is we, we give each sample our own unique number. So we identify it and then your inspector is going to also identify it. So this was from the master bathroom ceiling, the bathroom floor, and then the window. And here's the different sample types that they took. They took two tape lifts, which is basically adhesive tape. They stuck to a surface and peeled it back and that's their sample. And then the last one is a sterile swab. So they swabbed that discoloration. And with surface testing, you know, they collected it because it was discolored. You know, it looked like it mold growth to them. Either they're not sure, they wanted to know what type it was. And so here's the results here, what kind of mold growth was detected. So in this case, nothing was detected. And then we see what's a uh, background debris. So Background debris is just non-fungal material. Anything that's not mold, we put it into just 
background. And background can really affect the visibility of the sample, which, you know, regardless of what lab you use, they'll say, like, if you have something that's at a four or five, you know, that means our visibility is really low. Imagine rating fog on a road to a one to five scale. You know, if you're driving in a four or five level of fog, you're probably driving a lot slower. It's just like a little bit harder to see where you're going. And so the same could be said in this, in terms of your mold results. So with this being a four and a not detected, it's most likely that all that other material is mold, but there could be something missed just because it's a four. I, I, it's, you know, if there was like a very light level of mold, then it certainly could have been missed in that case. But uh, usually with not detected, it just means all that other debris is just non-fungal material. And we apply that same one to five scale to the different types of mold found. So in this case, this poor bathroom floor has a whole bunch of just crap on the floor. They should probably clean their floor. Um, but it also has a crap load of happy, happy mold. And so with this being both five, there could also be like another friend growing along with it that we couldn't see in that case. So it doesn't necessarily mean that there's only clad, cladosporium in, in this sample, but there certainly is a lot of it. You have mold, like at the end of the day, that's what matters. This is in fact mold, it's there. Um, so you have a water problem. And with it being on the floor, it's probably like puddles that aren't dried up right away especially like along creases and along bathtubs. A lot of people have mold growing there just because nobody goes through with a towel and wipes it dry. You technically should because that's the breeding ground for bacteria, yeast and mold to start growing. Um, but a lot of people don't. So then you have your mold growth and they don't know why. <laughs> um, any questions about surface testing while we're on this? It's pretty straightforward, which I really like. <laughs> And this is one of the things that I let homeowners collect themselves because this one's very easy to understand. Um, but in terms of air testing, I, I don't, I wouldn't recommend it. Always go through an industrial hygienist or something like that. So here's kind of visually what those scales are. These are just some examples in our that I've seen under our microscope. So this is a standard that we follow called, uh, the, basically it's a standard method that we're required to follow. And this is the one to five scale. Uh, we call some, I call something a five plus, meaning it's just like so much. It's layers upon layers of debris. I personally call, I call the inspectors. And if you, I'm so sorry if one of you have been affected by this, but I tell the inspectors, I'm not running this test these numbers are going to mean nothing to you. You know, I can't, I can't, I mean, look, you can't even see anything in this. Uh, it's just a smorgasbord layer of crap. Um, and so I, I'm, I always feel bad when I tell them, but it just, they collected the sample for too long. You know, they ran it for over 10 minutes or something like that, or they ran it for 10 minutes when in, they in reality should have done something like five minutes. You know, uh, whenever you're looking at your data and you see that background being a five, like just know you're reaching on this level. Um, and that's why it's really important to read the footer of your report because it says if you have a four or five, you know, it, it's looking like this, which is pretty, your eyes, like, because this is what we're looking at under a microscope. Our eyes can get really distracted if we're not really focused or, you know, something could look like you know, a thing over here just because there's just so much of it. So, but most of them, if you're around three or lower, that's kind of the happy spot. You know, you can see all these little spores very clearly, very obviously. So I, I usually look at the ratings and background debris and just kind of think of it visually. If you were thinking about fog, it kind of helps you just think about, you know, this is what the analyst was seeing. This is how the validity of your test results is. There is mold in those slides. The first there, one. Yeah, it was a, a cute little, that, that one's okay. probably a cladosporium or an ascospore. It's hard to see since it's so small, but, and this here is uh, probably an epicocum. They're just outdoor spores. Um, but these little blue, these are all skin. That's, oh. that's skin cells. That's wicked cool. So some people will get um, more than just the mold results. They'll ask mm -hmm. for mold and particulate analysis. Basically, we'll go through the sample and we'll count 
all these other things. So you'll get how many mold spores you have, but then also how many, how many skin cells do you have? How many black opaques do you have? I find that most people request that if they say, quote unquote, I want to know how my air quality is. Mm -hmm. They don't really know what they want. Um, I can find that it is helpful, especially in office buildings or commercial buildings, because you'll have these black opaque particulates. Which are? Yeah, like, and that, <laughs> I have a mouse pad. With, like, what what are they? Just stuff? Yeah, so basically think of black opaques like... Um, a carbon source, something's burning, um, and it'll emit this little thing. Um, or it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, it can be even from dry erasers. Um, when you wipe that away, all that little, mm -hmm. you know, when you go like this with yeah. those erasers, it's nasty. Yep. You're breathing that stuff in. It doesn't just like poof, disappear when you do that. Uh, so those can actually be, they can kind of cling to your lungs and cause lung irritation. And so if you see high, usually they're higher outside, you know, there's a lot of wood debris out there, cars all the time. So you'll see a lot of those primarily outdoors, but inside you should have those be lower by a lot and a lot more skin. So, if, so I'm super sensitive to every, like candles, perfumes, anything that's just everything at this point mm -hmm. in my immune system. Um, mm -hmm. If I took an air, like this one house that I go to, that it's, it really makes it makes me sick. Um, if I, and I'm, I'm going to have to sell it. it. It's not in my house. It's an ex of mine. They're going to be selling it. Can I do an air quality to see just for my own now, well, curiosity? Yeah. What's in it? Yeah. Yeah, I okay. have people, well, it can't do just particulates, so it has to be mold and it, it's yep, kind of, it's fine. which I don't know why, but that is the thing. No, he's gonna, no, I told me he has to test for mold before I even put it on the market anyways and address it if it's an issue, because I can, I can smell it. Yeah. Everything about it has, yeah, it needs yeah. a whole <laughs> Sounds fun. <laughs> too much, too much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so, um, yeah, I'll have, a, well, that's cool. there's times, so even on walls, you'll sometimes, if somebody burns a lot of candles, you'll actually see like mm -hmm. a line of, of candle debris on the wall. That looks a lot. I gotta say candles look a lot like mold on the wall. Um, just those little black spots on the yeah. wall or like a smoker you'll see those little spots on the wall too no i put some on counters and tables and stuff but it's it's in the air if i walk in i can't well it. it'll travel right. and get stuck on the walls oh no way yeah yeah, yeah. so That's there's crazy. some homes where it like it's they yeah. have to burn a lot and all the time but oh, yeah. it, it'll be it'll become noticeable af after a while see. yeah but yeah you'll probably see those black opaque numbers just spike mm -hmm. up in either the area of where it is or just in that property in general. Yeah. I'll be calling you later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now let's get confusing. Can't wait. So please pipe up with questions. This is air data. Um, so I'm just gonna give you some just like random examples um, and then we'll just kind of talk about some things. So if you have questions about a certain type of mold, like just let me know and we can chat about it too. So the first thing always that I do when I'm looking at air surface or whatever, I'm always looking at this background debris. It's probably because I'm an analyst and I know those pictures. <laughs> so I know visually kind of what the analyst was looking at. So I always first look at that. And almost always the outdoors will probably be a low two just because it's pretty clean outside. Um, you know, there's a lot more air out there than indoors. And once you get indoors, that usually levels up. But in this case, the indoor sample had a four. So there was just a good number of stuff. It's not a five, but it's still a lot. So some things could be undercounted in this case. So I always keep that in mind when I'm looking at the numbers. And here's like I was saying before, the raw count versus the counts per cubic meter. So this is what the lab counted. We Tick, 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 counted, counted. And then we take your sample volume and we turn it into how many spores are in a cubic box of air. So imagine just like a cubic box, a cardboard box, and it's just empty and it's filled with the air of the room. That's how many little dots of spores are in there. Does that make sense? It's okay to say no. <laughs> okay. Is, is there an average amount of yeah. like what these spores are usually indoors? Because I'm sure that 
at all times, there's some level of spores around. There's always some level, but it's hard to even say what an average is, um, I, even from an outdoor sample, because seasonality is an insane thing it, when we read these samples. It changes a lot from one sample to the next. So I can't even give you an average. Um, I can, like an average high, well, I'm used to seeing raw counts. So uh, that's, you know, that's what I count. So if I see something over a thousand or something like that, that's pretty significant. You know, that's a lot of spores. Um, and it's like 500 or under, or even 300. And so I have a report in front of me. And honestly, I have a two for my outdoor degree. Raw count for the total is 499. So and those are just total counts? Yeah, so your like your total mold spores and fragments, your raw count, uh, your two thousand minus four ninety nine, and it's I have a two for background. Yeah, and this this is just like a this would be like a normal summer day probably. So it's oh, okay. pretty summery. So it's not even like a mold issue potentially. The outdoor sample. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's an outdoor sample. That's right. I'm like I want to. Well, no, actually, my indoor one of my indoors was two thirty six. Yeah, well, this is a this is a great example for uh, looking at total counts, and I don't even look at total counts. This is a great okay. reason why it's misleading. Um, okay. You know, you see two thousand outdoors, and you see one thousand indoors, and you think mm -hmm. oh, it's lower than the outdoor sample. There's right. no problem. It's gonna be great. The next. <laughs> right. um, but then once you start to look at the, what types, so <laughs> ascospores and basidiospores are really common outdoor spores. So all of a sudden we're in the outdoors, we're seeing a ton of those, but you go indoors and there's none of them, which- But there's some. <laughs> yeah, there's always some. And this okay. is a very bland example that's right. being very obvious. Uh, but all of a sudden you're seeing that 1000 is all these different mold types that were not found outdoors. Um, and so that's pr this is pretty, I would say this is likely there's indoor growth. There wasn't anything found outdoors. I mean, there'll always be some, but I, I I don't even look at the total count because not unless you look at each certain type, you can't really say how it's changing from outdoors to indoors. So you need to compare the two. I always compare they're, the two. They're relative. Yeah, kind okay. of think of the outdoor as the baseline. You know, okay. This yep. is the outdoor exposure. You know, this is what is influencing the indoors. Indoors better for the most part. Maybe she doesn't even have a mold issue for all I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so in this example, there there is the stacky botrys in here, and he gets a really bad rep. Uh, everybody says that he's the black mold. People call you, do I have the black mold all the time? Uh, like it's some sort of thing. And it's, it's not. Uh, go on the EPA's website and they say it super amazingly and they say the the words don't even exist they don't mean uh, 60 minutes no. like 20 years ago in florida like that, that's what that's when it happened i think yeah it's it's insane <laughs> how <clears throat> much misinformation is out there like you know they talk about black mold as if it means something and it doesn't mean anything um basically what they say on the epa's website is the the mold can come in so many different colors. Just because you see the color black on your wall, it doesn't mean you're dealing with one specific type of mold. You know, it's kind of like saying, you know, oh, you know, I saw a black bird today and no one's going to know exactly what you're talking about, what kind of bird. It could be a number of different species of birds. You know, they're not all one come or same, but like, oh, it's a white bird. You know, were you talking about a seagull? Were you talking about a cute little bird? Like, doesn't color doesn't mean anything, especially to your lab. Um, I love how many people call me and ask me, yeah, but do I have the black mold? Like it's the black plague or something like that. It's, it's really not. Um, same with toxic mold. Is there any toxic mold in my house? And even stachybotrys is one of those mold types that has the potential to create toxins, but it doesn't mean that the mold itself is toxigenic, meaning you know, you find it present in the home, you find stachybotrys growing on the wall. That doesn't mean it's producing toxins. It doesn't mean that it's doing that. Like there's some people who will do toxin, like mycotoxin testing. 
that's just like kind of a waste of your money. It's really expensive for no reason because stachybotrys isn't going to always create those toxins all the time. It's not always producing those toxins and just, you know, fuming you with mycotoxins. That's not the case. And that's why the EPA and CDC says toxic mold isn't even a real word because you're not being always flooded with toxins if they're present. And even just if you breathe in some of their spores, it doesn't mean you're breathing in toxins. That's just not the case. So mold isn't a, a silent little killer that's going to kill you. It's, you know, they're cute. Mm, nice. <laughs> they won't cut you, I swear. <laughs> so Bill, like, like you were saying, you know, all it takes is the news. Just boom. I hear people say mold is gold. You know, all these remediators were saying, I'm going to come in. I'm going to kill all the mold. I'm going to kill it, but they don't even talk about water, you know, that, so then you come back and they, they, you have mold growing, you know, a month later because they didn't solve the cause, which is the water issue. It's actually, you know, that's the real problem. So all these people saying black mold all over the place, this is what your customers see. This is what they think. And so when you're talking to them about their data, you have to keep this in mind that this is like the scary world that they live in. This is why they hired, you know, a mold test when it's not even recommended. You know, they're actually terrified of it and kind of having that in the back of your head of like, these people are scared. You're going to need to kind of like talk them off of a cliff. You know, they're trying to say, oh, I'm going to jump out of this buy because there's mold and or there's the black mold. There's stachybotrys in the sample, which means you've got to burn the house down. There's no other option. You know, that's that's the world that they're in. So keep that in mind when you're talking to them and explain, you know, that whole water component. Okay, your inspector found that there is a leak in the basement. You just need to fix that leak. All of a sudden that mold problem goes away. It's really, really that easy. So this is a more real world example, kind of similar to yours of the outdoor, here's the living room, here's the basement. And these outdoor, so I look at the, the background debris, they're all pretty even, it's a little bit high in the basement, but it's right in the middle ground. I look at these ASCO spores and Basidio spores, they're really high outside and all of a sudden they're kind of dropping lower. You know, they're pretty low. It's strange that they spike a little bit in the basement, but maybe there's a window, those little sliding windows. Maybe they had that open to try to fume out all of that mold smell before the inspector comes. I have a lot of people do that. Um, and so all of a sudden you see those numbers kind of spike in the basement. Um, ask the inspector, was any windows open? Sometimes people will be like, oh yeah, I noticed the window was open. So I closed it while the mold sample was going. So that can be something to keep in mind. You know, why did it elevate down there? There's probably a pretty logical reason as to why. And we look at that aspergillus and penicillium. There were some outside, but all of a sudden, boom, living room. There's a pretty big jump. You know, where, where do those come from? And then you look in the basement and there's, you know, 2,000. Yep. Yeah. So it's pretty clear, you know, and then you look at the inspection, that assessment Hi. part. Yeah, they, they, the inspector went through and yeah, they took humidity readings in the living room. It wasn't that high. It was, it was okay. And then they went in the basement. Oh yeah, the person had a dehumidifier down there. The humidity reading was still at like 50, 60% down there or, you know, something like that. You know, that all makes sense. You know, the levels were high. The water was there. You have probably molds growing down there. Same with that. Uh, Cladosporium tends to be a little more difficult because he likes outdoor environments, but he also loves wood in the indoor environments. Sometimes he'll be a little tricky. Like in this case, it's pretty close, you know, 76 to 59. It's negligible. It's pretty similar because you're talking about just like a five, 10 minute test. You know, a lot can change from one five minutes to the next. So it's hard to say in those cases where the numbers are so close, um, like say if it was 50 to 50 in these two areas, and those are the only two samples that somebody took, that would be a lot harder for me to say whether you have a problem somewhere else in the house or in that area of the house. Does that make sense? So if my outdoor counts are higher than my indoor counts, I'm doing pretty good. 
Yeah, yeah. Almost always people awesome. will compare the outdoors to the indoors. Okay. If it's lower, it usually means that it's better. Um, usually is the strong word there of, you know, unless it's blaringly obvious, just keep in mind, this is a short-term test. Right. It's only five minutes and who knows what was going on at the time of this collection. You don't know until you ask the inspector. Is there a certain ratio between your outdoor and indoor where you say, okay, probably should have it assessed and remediated or again, source needs to be corrected or if this, if anything shows up in here, you just need to remediate the source regardless. Um, like say somebody hasn't done the test or they have the test results? No, they have the test results. Um, you know, if my indoor counts are comparably lower than my outdoor counts. Do we still find the source or remediate it? Is there, is there, if there's anything shows up on these tests, basically, do you need to remediate? Yeah, if I say I saw this, me personally, this is just biased opinion, um, mm -hmm. that I would probably say, yeah, you need to clean up the basement. You yep. need to figure okay. out that water, whether it's liquid or vapor, yep. and then yep. you need to find where that mold is growing and clean that up. Yep. And I'm sure once they go in, if they want to do a PRV test, I'm yeah. sure that number will we'll go that then. Okay. It's not required to do a PRV. A lot of people don't. It's expensive. So oh, it don't is. hire someone to come. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's usually cheaper, but it depends mm -hmm. on who you hire. It's still going to be a good right. chunk of change. It's not going to be free, you know? Right. And then another thing too, is that stacky buttress. He, he likes very wet environments and he also doesn't like to, ketomium is another one too. Um, they don't like to release their spores unless like being slapped around a little bit and they like really wet environments like in this case so in this case we have the indoor and the outdoor look at these backgrounds i mean it's really it's pretty clean in the indoor so visually the your results are pretty valid in this case it's a three and a two people are being able to see really well you're seeing the outdoor influence. There's one ASCO spore. So there's like a little bit, but not much. And you see the ASC pen is 13 here and 11 here. Well, that's really close, like really close. So you're not sure whether something's growing indoors and look here and you see ketomium. Okay, that's strange. And then you look and you see stachybotrys too. And usually those are kind of signs of just really wet, wet, wet regions. And so ask the inspector, look through the inspection report. Was there a lot of water found? Yeah, then that all kind of lines up. So likely you do have mold growth, even if it's a one, you, you, you could, as long as that inspection report says there was a lot of water wherever he collected this. Does that make sense? Sorry, that was almost kind of tough, but I always look when it's this low, I always look at the inspection, especially like really close because this is so close to not being anything. But by knowing what type it is, that can kind of help you guess a little bit better. So I assume where I've got a five on, on my, both my indoor tests that if you're seeing something, then it's pretty obvious you're seeing something. Did the vibe even? Yeah, like, and honestly, I will say, like I get tests like these sometimes that are really low and it's not super obvious. And that's when mm -hmm. I really rely on the inspector to interpret it. Mm -hmm. But in that other example, in your case, like it's pretty clear, there's a lot right. downstairs. And see it. Yeah, and you can right. see it. Just use common sense, really. Yeah. And I'm being mindful of the time. I'm just gonna scoot through here. You know, this is another case of this spikes up in this area hard to say in this case which one is the source but with this being really high it's probably this one kind of a thing and even though these levels are all the same like more or less it's probably just an open window or something like that so i can send bill all of these links i find these the most yeah. helpful cdc epa osha the maine under air quality council AIHA is another great tool. So I'll send this to Bill and he can send it around to the group. They're really helpful. This is just their basic web page. They have so many different tip sheets on there, like super recommend their tip sheets just to print and give your clients because that just makes them feel better. Okay. Now, if we want to talk about anything like specific to personal cases or anything else that I didn't cover that you really